Okay, I, I bet uh, most of you don't know this, um, but I have a history of being a liar. Now, b before you get up and leave, <laughs> yeah, is that true? <laughs> That's a good one. I didn't anticipate that. But, uh, before you get up and leave, uh, let me see if I can explain myself. Perhaps I should say that I'm a recovering liar because I don't have a problem telling the truth now. Uh, but when I was a child, I was a, I was a big fat liar uh, when, I was, when I was young. And uh, um, I had a problem telling the truth. And, and let me tell you something. This had my mother more concerned than anything else in the world. It says, what, what, what have I done that my child feels the need to lie all the time? I remember my mom asking me questions like, well, why did you lie about that? Why, why did you feel the need to lie? And then she would ask me questions like this. This was the real killer. She says, do you know who the father of lies is? The devil is the father of lies. Is the devil your father? I said, no, mom, she is not my, he is not my father. And, and here's an example. And it was always something innocuous like this too. It was just, a, it never had a good reason to lie. It was one time when I was in my mother's bedroom and she had this chest of drawers and on that chest of drawers was a, you know, different perfumes. And I was fascinated by this one bottle in particular, its shape. And, and, and so naturally I picked it up and, and when you have something that sprays anything and you're a child, I don't care who you are, you want to spray it, right? And so I thought, well, it wouldn't hurt to, to spray it a couple of times. And as you know, perfume, once it, uh, uh, you know, becomes aerosol into the air, it, it, it just like occupies the space of the room. And there's no hiding the fact that you've sprayed this perfume. And, it, and suddenly the room smells pretty uh, perfumey, right? And so no big deal though. I sprayed perfume, left the room harmless. That shouldn't be a big deal. Well, well again, my uh, mom came in the room a few minutes later and she says, uh, boys, I have a brother, he's 20 months older than me. Was uh, someone in here spraying my perfume? We both come over and my brother says, I didn't do it because it was true. He didn't do it, right? And then I said, I didn't do it because that was a lie. I was, I was not telling the truth. Now, now, there's only two children in the house and she's pretty sure that my dad would have no reason to spray the perfume. So she asks again, who did it? Who sprayed the perfume? It had to be, it had to be one of you two. She's smart like this, she knows, right? Not me, said my brother. And I replied in like manner, not me either, okay? Now my mom was getting upset. It wasn't the fact that someone sprayed her perfume, right? It was the fact that someone was lying about it, that someone felt the need to lie and she did not tolerate lying. And so this is what she said. She said, if one of you, if one of you doesn't confess, you know, fess up and tell the truth, you're both gonna get punished. You're both gonna get punished. Well, now my brother is in a panic and frankly, so am I, okay? <laughs> And, and he starts to plead, hey, wait a minute, I didn't do it, I didn't do anything, why should I be punished? Seeing him plead his case made me believe that if I'm gonna get away with this, I've gotta plead equally intensely about this. Uh, yeah, I didn't do it either, why should I be punished for something that I didn't do, right? So guess what happened? My mom, true to her word, punished us both. Okay, we both got uh, smacked in the bottom. And so there we were boo-hooing over the fact that we just got punished. And then my mom asks again, now, who sprayed the perfume? Now, see, at this point, I'm thinking, well, I've already been punished, you know? The worst of it is over. If I confess now, I suffered, I've suffered the worst of it. So I confess, I did it, mom. I'm the one that sprayed the perfume. And guess what happened next? Punishment phase two. <laughs> My mom took me by the hand, led me to the sink, and it was the only time in my life that she ever did this, and she washed my mouth out with soap. Does that, has anyone here ever had that treatment? Only, okay, a couple of you. Yeah, they don't do that anymore, right? They're, this is not the kind of punishment we hear about anymore, but back in the day, it was all the time. You know, these guys, same with, same with getting smacked in the bottom too, but uh, all that to say, I never lied again. <laughs> that was enough, that was enough. And I want you to appreciate what my mom was trying to instill in me. I think, I think many parents, again, don't use these methods of discipline anymore and say what you want to about them. I turned out pretty good. I turned, <laughs> I turned out all right, right? But again, what was my mom trying to instill in me? What was she trying to instill in me? Say it again. Integrity. Why, why? She wanted me to tell the truth, right? She wanted me to, she wanted me to be a truth teller a person of integrity, right? Now, if you're dealing with someone who isn't a truth teller, then, then you're not gonna be willing to give them your, your time, your attention, or money, or whatever, the, whatever it is, whatever it is, right? Truth, truth 
is the single biggest factor when you make an investment in, in a person at any level, be it a friendship, a business relationship, whatever. The fact that they're a truth teller, that's going to inform your decision to be in a relationship with them, whatever kind of relationship that is, right? Uh, you're, you're more apt to invest in someone if you believe they're not telling a lie. Am I right about that? Do you think, you think that's true? Yes. Uh, it, it comes down to an issue of credibility. It ultimately comes down to an issue of credibility. Now, there's an issue in the Bible that we're going to look at today, and it also comes down to an issue of credibility. Now, what's, what's the issue I'm talking about? And I, I teased you with this on the email. Uh, as we open up the New Testament, as we open up the New Testament, we have the gospel accounts. And in those gospel accounts, we read about Jesus. We read about his disciples. We read about his mother and the soldiers who interacted with him and his disciples. We, we read about the Pharisees and, and uh, the officials who doubted him and ultimately had him crucified the sick people that he healed, the sinners that he gave salvation. So then as we leave the gospel accounts, right, as we leave the gospel accounts, who is it that writes a majority of the text that remains in the New Testament outside of the gospels? Who is it? It's Paul. It's the apostle Paul. And maybe, maybe you've never thought about this, right? Or maybe it's just never bothered you. But why? It bothered me for a long time. I'll tell you that right now. It bothered me for a long time. Why? Did God choose someone like Paul to be the chief author of the New Testament? Why not? I always used to think this. Why not one of the original apostles? Why not John, Peter, or, or uh, uh, James? Any of those guys, right? Um, I don't know how you feel about engaging with, uh, with people of, of the, like Jehovah's Witnesses, for instance. I enjoy talking to, to people of, of, uh, of, of that faith. Uh, and it's been a while since any of them knocked on my door, but for whatever reason, I had numerous occasions to talk to them uh, in college. Maybe there was a lot that went to my, my college. Uh, and I was equally fascinated by people of the Mormon religion, too. And what I find so fascinating about them is that they really are very good people. They're very good people in spite of the fact that we, we confess very different things and believe very different things, right? It's fascinating to me. But anyway, if you've ever had the occasion uh, to study the makings of other religions, like, for example, Jehovah's Witnesses or, or the Mormons, you discover their, revel their, their religion is, is a religion that is based on revelation. We've talked about this before, special revelation, right? Uh, revelation to primarily an individual, okay, to an individual. For Jehovah's Witnesses, it was a guy by the name of Charles Russell, okay? And, and the Mormons, there's another guy by the name of Joseph Smith. These are the central figures of their, of their religion. Each of these men claim to have special revelation from God. And, and based on the revelation, they each started their own system of belief that is contrary to what you and I would confess in our, our faith. Now, I don't think it's a stretch to say that I don't believe any of you here today are Mormon. I don't believe any of you today here are Jehovah's Witness. You might be, uh, and that would be a surprise to me, but I, I'm going on record saying I don't think you are, because what does it come down? It comes down to a matter of belief. I don't think you'd be here if you believe those things. I think you'd believe, be somewhere else, right? You don't believe the claims that they make. And this was something that I love to challenge the Jehovah's Witnesses about. Why Charles Russell? Why Charles Russell? What made Charles Russell so special that he was able to receive these special revelations, just him. What was so special about him that he was able to receive these revelations, right? And, and, and aside from, from religions like the Jehovah's Witnesses or Mormons, there are hosts of other lesser known cults that start in similar fashion. Someone claims to have a special revelation from God, people buy into it, and just like that, a new cult is formed, okay? Based on the revelation to one person, right? So, how is Christianity set apart from that? Have you ever thought about that? There are people who would argue that Christianity is no different, that uh, Mormonism and Jehovah's Witnesses is just like Christianity. God revealed himself instead of someone like Charles Russell or Joseph Smith. He revealed himself to the chief author of the New Testament, the Apostle Paul, right? He wrote most of it. He wrote most of it. And, and uh, so what makes Christianity so special? What gives Paul the credibility? It's, again, it comes down to an issue of credibility. Why do we believe Paul? Why do we include his writings in our Bible, but we don't include the writings of, of Charles Russell, you know, or, or Joseph Smith, or Muhammad for that matter, right? They all claim special revelation. That's what I'd like to uh, discuss today. So first of all, we, can, we, wanna, we wanna rewind a little bit. Okay, before there was Muhammad, before there was Joseph Smith or, or Charles Russell, even before Paul, right? 
there are all these guys in the Old Testament, guys like Isaiah, Jeremiah, and, and, and Hosea, basically into the Old Testament prophets. And each of those guys, each of those guys had a burden. They had a burden uh, put upon them in a sense to justify their calling, to prove their calling, to prove that what they said was true, okay? And, uh, and if they were going to utter the words, thus saith the Lord, they had to prove that their calling was indeed of that of God Almighty. That was the burden that was put upon them. So how do we know that the prophet was telling the truth? You know, there was a simple litmus test for this. In the, in the Old Testament, if your prophecies were accurate, you got to live. If your prophecies were inaccurate, you had your mouth washed out with soap. No, no, no. You, you died. If you, if, you're, if you told a prophecy in the Old Testament, you know, this is, this is from the, the Pentateuch, from the law. If you were a prophet and your prophecies didn't come true, you, you, you met death, okay? Uh, again, now, most people, for example, didn't like what Isaiah said. Uh, he, he uh, in fact, no one liked what he said. And history tells us that he was martyred for it. He was killed for it, but it wasn't because what he was saying wasn't true. What he said, even at the beginning of Isaiah 6, he talks about the time and place when he was called and how he was called. That was his burden to show, here's, here's why you can trust me. Here's why you can believe what I'm saying. Here was my encounter with God. And then the prophecies that he said, oh my goodness. Like we talked, I think we talked about this last week. If you read Isaiah 53, it almost reads as an, as a, as an eyewitness account of the crucifixion, right? So what he said was true. What he said was true. Incredible. Now in the New Testament, the apostles, and we talked about this last week, those who walk with Jesus in the flesh took on the role that the prophets had in the Old Testament. And they carried, uh, and they carried this uh, uh, before the arrival of, of uh, uh, that the Old Testament carried before the arrival of Christ. Since the apostles walked and talked with Jesus because they sat under him and learned from him and, and, and witnessed firsthand his miracles and his sermons and, and the acts of Christ, they were able to speak with authority. I walked with him, you know, and he commissioned me. He, he directly empowered me to speak his words so they had the authority to speak this, again this is what we talked about last last week so they could say thus saith the lord all right just like the prophets of the old testament they announced the revelation of god with nothing less the, than the authority of god now if we open our, our our bibles to the first chapter of acts okay if we open up our bibles to the first chapter of acts we can read what the qualifications to be an apostle are uh, so if you have your Bibles, turn to Acts chapter 1, beginning in verse 21. And, uh, and uh, you can either hear me read it. I'm going to try and put it up here, like I said. But in this passage, in this passage, we see 11 apostles devoting themselves to prayer, wanting to, to replace Judas, right, who had killed himself after, after his betrayal of Jesus. So, so let's pick up there, Acts 1, 21 and following. And see, as we read this, as we read this, see if you can pick up on what the qualifications for an apostle are, all right? See if you can pick up what the uh, qualifications are. And let's try this and see if it works. Oh, not quite, not quite ready. There we go. Do you see that? Does everyone see that? Good. It says this, Acts one twenty one and following. Uh, do you, I hope you folks can see it at home too. Here we go. So one of the men who have, it says this, so one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taking up. They're saying, this is, this is what we're looking for. One of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. And they put forward two, Joseph called Barsabbas, who was also called Justice, and Matthias. They prayed and said, you, Lord, you know the hearts of all. Show us which one of these two you have chosen to take the place of this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them, and the lot fell on Matthias. And he was numbered with the 11 apostles. Did you hear it? Did you hear what the qualifications are? Does anyone want to try and, and tell me what those might be? Did you hear them? What was one? Someone named one. Did you hear one? That from, from, they had to be there when he was baptized. They said, from the, we walk with him and talk in the ministry of Jesus from the time that he was baptized by John all the way to the end. So you had to be a firsthand witness of his entire ministry. And what that means is you had to be his disciple. You had to be his follower. You had to learn from him. And also towards the end there, he mentions apostleship. He's replacing, they're replacing Judas, the, who, was, who was conferred the authority of an apostle. So same thing here. 
had to be an apostle, had to have the, that authority conferred upon them by Jesus Christ. Again, there's only one way to be an apostle. And that one way to be an apostle was what? You had to have to be commissioned firsthand by, by Jesus himself. And if you weren't conferred that authority firsthand by Jesus himself, you could not be an apostle. So again, you had to be with him throughout his entire ministry. You had to be, he had to have the, the authority of apostle conferred upon you. And they're also putting in the stipulation, witness to his resurrection. You had to have all those things. You had to have all things, okay? So there's a debate that goes on today in the church to this very day as to whether or not uh, there are apostles in the church today. Most of us say no. No, because of these very qualifications. There's no one alive today who has had direct and immediate calling from Christ, nor could anyone alive today say that they were a witness to his resurrection. Okay? So no sooner do we make that argument, no sooner do we state that, that there aren't apostles today when someone will come out and say, you can probably guess where I'm going this, with this, what about Paul? What about Paul? Paul wasn't a disciple of Christ during his ministry. Paul wasn't a witness to the resurrection, not in the same way that the uh, other disciples were. So Paul loses out on two of three of the credentials to be an apostle. Now, what Paul does have, what Paul does have, and perhaps this is the, one of the main reasons that Luke wrote this account, is to answer this very question. Paul does have a direct and immediate calling from Christ. And because of that, he receives the authority of an apostle. But circ circling back to this modern day debate, then someone can say, if that's all it takes is, right, someone to be conferred that authority by Christ himself, someone can say, well, uh, today, just like Paul, someone could have a direct and immediate call from Christ. They could have a vision or a dream. Jesus came to me. Jesus came to me and conferred that authority to me, just like the Apostle Paul. Do you see the dilemma here? Do you see the dilemma? Do you see why there can be concern over the legitimacy of Paul's apostolic authority of our Bible? Because I could, I could come in here this evening. I could come in here this evening and tell you, guess what, guys? I had a dream last night. Jesus came to me, and he told me that, that I'm an apostle, that I'm an apostle now. He conferred that authority upon me. And now, from now on, and I also have a book. I got a book. And in that book, from now on, I want your Bibles to go Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Lee, Eric. That's what I'd like your Bibles to look like from now on. I have, a, I have the authority to do that, right? Right? Now, as ridiculous as that sounds, it's not different than what the others, these other religions that we've already talked about are saying. They're saying the very same thing. They're saying, I have authority from God to speak on his behalf. And I've been given that authority by God himself. Okay? Now, how is Paul different from that? Okay, let's, let's look again in the book of Acts. Turn over a few pages to the ninth chapter of Acts, beginning in verse 1. The ninth chapter of Acts, beginning in verse 1, says this. Come on. 9-1. But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, this is followers of Christ belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. So right away, uh, right away, sorry about that, uh, we see Luke giving an account of who Paul is, or Saul, as he's called here. Uh, we're telling, he's telling us exactly who he was. He was already known. He already had this reputation in and, and among the church as the scourge of the Christian community. He, he wanted to rid the world of this heretical sect of people that were known as followers or, or part of the way, right? And, and he was out, he was, he was out to, 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 to get these people because he believed that they were undermining the purity of, of the faith of the, of, of the Jewish fathers, okay, of Judaism. So Saul had been trained in, in, in rabbinic instruction. He had studied under the most well-known rabbinic scholar of his day, and he called himself a Pharisee of Pharisees. It's been said by historians that Paul had the equivalent of two PhDs by the time he was 21 years old. That's pretty impressive. And he was educated, probably the most educated man in the land. All right. So this is why Luke is so detailed about spelling all this out for us. Here you have this man, a, a Jew of Jews, okay, who is exterminating Christians suddenly becomes the spokesperson for them. Right. Luke thought it was very important to give us this detailed account of exactly how radical of a conversion that, that, uh, that took place here. It's very similar to how Old Testament prophets would, would explain their calling. Uh, Luke is detailing the calling of, of Saul for us too, right here in the, in the New Testament. Now, so continuing on in verse uh, three, 
verse three. Let's get it up here again. Seems to telling my son he needs to be my tech guy so he can advance this for me. All right, now, as he went on his way, he approached Damascus and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him and falling to the ground, he heard a voice to him say, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? So, so Saul sees this blinding bright light, right? And, and he falls to the ground as this voice says to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Whenever, whenever you see a, a word repeated like this in the Bible, I know some of you know this, uh, it's very intentional. It's a literary device and it's often used in the spoken word too. Uh, and it's meant to convey emphasis special emphasis. The only thing that we might compare this to is, is the use of the middle name. For instance, when we call our children, if Tracy calls my son Jack, Jack Edward, what does that mean? It means Jack's in big trouble. It means Jack's in big trouble. When my younger son was little and he would get in trouble, Jack or, or Tracy would say his first and middle name, Logan Tice. Logan Tice, you come here. Logan Tice, you stop doing that. Logan Tice, sit down. So even my, my son Logan started to get the sense of this is, this is important whenever Logan Tice is used. And one time my son Logan was getting frustrated with his brother and he said, Jack Tice. <laughs> so in the Bible, it's special emphasis. He, he just got the name wrong. He knew it meant something, but he just got the name wrong. So in the Bible, when we see the name repeated like this and you see it all throughout the Bible, you know, David yelling out Absalom, Absalom, right? Or, or, or here, uh, Saul, Saul right? If you know someone by their first and middle name, there's a degree of familiarity and, 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 and intimacy there. And so this is effectively what's happening here to Saul. Saul, Saul, I know you. I know everything about you, right? I know you intimately and I want your attention now. Listen to me. Listen to me, Paul. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Okay, and what's interesting is we see the same account of Paul's conversion later. He, Paul details this, this account uh, himself for us in, in Acts chapter 26, almost an identical word for word account. Again, because this is another thing that we talked about last week, how Luke was sort of the, the right-hand man of, of Paul, and he would write down the accounts. You know, that's why it has apostolic authority. And so that's why when you see this almost word for word comparison between this account and then what's in Acts chapter 26, it's almost identical because it came from, from Paul himself. All right, well, Paul is talking about his own conversion to King Agrippa. And when he gets to this part, uh, uh, he recalled, this is Acts uh, 24, or excuse me, Acts 26, 14. Acts 26, 14. Do I hear music? <laughs> the students must be. I wonder if you, you all can hear that too online. But we have uh, some background music that's not coming from our resident pianist. So here we go. Uh, and then... Oh, and when he had fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting against me? Why are you persecuting me? It's hard for you to kick against the goads. What in the world does that mean? Kick against the goads, right? Uh, there's another passage in the Bible where if you were, this is just another one that if you were reading this and you came across that kick against the goads, you might think, what in the world does that mean? Next verse, right? What does that mean? I'm going to tell you what it means. Uh, a, lar a large part of my job as a parent is, is building boundaries for my children, establishing boundaries. This is what my, my wife and I do all the time, because if you, if you let them do whatever they wanted to do, whenever they wanted to do it, how would they turn out? They'd turn out pretty bad. They'd turn out to be pretty awful human beings. And if you just want an example, if you want a, a slight example of this, you know, look at most of the child actors out there that have gone astray. What happens? They're, they're given everything. They're given unlimited money. They're given unlimited attention, unlimited, they do whatever they want. And what happens to them? They self-destruct because every, every single boundary has been removed from them and they can do whatever they want. And what happens? Self-destruction, right? So as a parent, you build boundaries and, and they hate the boundaries. They, they're absolutely, but they're absolutely good for them. These boundaries are good for them. You give them boundary because if you let them do whatever they want to do, they, we, we wouldn't be preparing them for life right? The boundary is, is a show of love from the parent. So what is an ox goad? What's an ox goad? Uh, an ox goad is a boundary. It's a boundary. I, I don't know if any of you have heard R.C. Sproul detail this narrative, but it's so memorable. I, love, I loved hearing him talk about this. He says in the ancient world, most of the carts were drawn for labor in the fields. Uh, they were drawn by oxen, okay? And the oxen were yoked and fastened to the cart, and sometimes the oxen would act like mules and become stubborn. And, 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 uh, and, and when they were prodded to move, they would get rebellious, and they would kick back at the cart, right? 
And sometimes they could damage the cart when they kick back at it, or even if they were kicking hard, they could damage themselves, right? If they, they kicked hard enough, just like a child kicking against their, their parents, boundaries they've established for them. I don't like to be told what to do, this ox is saying, right? And so if the ox would kick hard enough, they would damage the cart and again, even themselves. So the farmers who had these stubborn oxen, right, would, 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 uh, that would fight them, they would have this device or this method of preventing them from fighting against them. So they would, they would put spikes on the cart. And so if the oxen would try and kick the spikes, the oxen would go, ooh, that hurt. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't do that anymore, right? Those are called ox goat. And so they kick these spikes and, and, and do the oxen then learn to stop kicking most of the time. Most of the time it would work, but, but, but just like kids, though you place boundaries around them and, and it works the same way for adults too, though they sometimes to their own detriment are, are punished for breaching those boundaries, they still persist with their stubborn behavior like me as a child when I, was, when I kept lying. So there were some oxen who were dumb and they would kick and they would hurt themselves and still kick and hurt themselves some more, right? And often this would get the, the oxen only further enraged and they would kick all the more, you know? And they're just banging against them and they're only hurting themselves and they get them more angry and they keep kicking. And this is how Jesus is describing Saul. Isn't that interesting? This is how Jesus is describing Saul's behavior when he's telling that he's kicking against the goads. It's like saying, and this is how R.C. Sproul would say it, Saul, you stupid ox, he was saying. You go from town to town trying to destroy my church. You're kicking against the ox goad, and all you're doing is hurting yourself. Because see, the Lord already knows what, what Saul's going to be called to do. He already knows. You're hurting yourself. You're going to be the apostle to the Gentiles, Paul. So stop killing people. Stop killing my church, you stupid ox, is what he's saying. And then he says this, this is in verse five. So uh, back to Acts nine, verse five, uh, says this, Acts nine, verse five. Man, they're loud. Can you, can you see if the doors are closed, Jack, and see if uh, they're all closed? These are open. All right, can you check? Can you check on both sides? And he said, this is Acts nine, verse five. And he said, who are you, Lord? That's so funny to me. He says, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. He says, well, who are you, Lord? Who are you, Lord? Again, that's an interesting way to phrase it. It's tricky because he uses the word there that we have translated it in Greek as the word kurios. Okay, kurios. And much like the word Lord that we use today, you can translate it one of two ways. It could either mean God or it could mean master right? In the same way that we use Lord today. And so what is he saying? Is he saying, who are you, God, or who are you, master? And I say, what's the difference? Makes no difference to me, right? Put yourself in his shoes. He's knocked off his feet. He's hit with this brilliant white light. And either way, he's acknowledging the supremacy of whatever it is that's before him. And he's a good Jew, so he knows that he shouldn't bow his knee to anybody or anything but God. And so if he's saying, who are you, Lord? I think he knows. I think he knows he's in the presence of something that is not of this world, that is of God himself. And so he says, who are you, Lord? Okay. And he's speaking, on, he's speaking to Jesus on behalf of the triune God. And I find it interesting that Paul, who wrote in Romans, that whether we want to acknowledge it or not, there's something deep down inside of all of us. There's something deep down inside of all of us that knows our creator is. And so again, when Paul is denying Jesus, and when he says, who are you, Lord? I think there's this something internal that says, okay, I, I, I have no choice but to acknowledge this now. I have to acknowledge this, okay? Let's finish this account. Uh, and just, again, he was just being squeezed in the moment. He had no alternative but to, to confess. Uh, so let's finish this account and, 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 and try and answer the question that we began with. Now, what sets Paul apart from anyone else who claims to be an apostle? Uh, again, even if they don't have the credentials that, uh, that the apostles spelled out in the beginning of Acts. So let's continue with verse six. Let's continue with verse six. Here we go. For the folks at home. But rise and enter the city. So this is uh, Jesus talking to Paul. And you'll be told what to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. So that's an important distinction too here, right? That there are witnesses uh, to this event, unlike uh, or, or Mr. Russell or Mr. Mr. Uh, Smith from the other religions, right? Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. 
So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. Now, there was a disciple at uh, Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. And he said, here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, rise and go to the street called Straight. And at this house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying. And as he has seen in a vision, a man named Ananias come and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, and I want to say that the inflection here would be something like this, Lord, <laughs> are you kidding? I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And, he has, and, and, and here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, go. For he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed and entered the house. And laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, Brother Saul, calls him brother. The Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized and taking food, he was strengthened. So there's the difference. There is our answer. Did you catch it? Did you see it? When Paul received his call, let's notice the difference here. Let's notice the difference here between Paul and anyone else who claims apostolic authority. He received his call and he was sent back to the church in Jerusalem, right? So what does that mean? Well, how is this different? How is this different than, than, than say, Charles Russell or, or Joseph Smith? How is what's happening here to Paul different than what they, what's happening to them or what had happened to them allegedly? Who is verifying? Say it again. The apostles. The apostles. So the apostles themselves verified Again, what are apostles? Who are the apostles? They are the ones that have been given authority to speak on behalf of Christ himself, right? He was sent back to the church at Jerusalem, and he was confirmed by that group of men about whose apostolic authority there was no question, okay? So remember, as these apostles, as they act and speak on behalf of Jesus, these are the ones who conferred and said, hey, this guy, this guy is uh, um, of the Lord, Okay, he was confirmed by the ones who had credibility and the apostolic credentials. Jesus sent him back to the church, and Ananias tried to tell the Lord, do you know what you're doing here, Lord? <laughs> this is crazy. Do you know who this is? Do you know who you're dealing with? This? Of course I know, right? Of course I know. And the Lord answered him, he's my chosen instrument. Not to belabor the point, but this is why I can't claim to be an apostle. This is why I can't do that, right? Uh, I can't claim to do that citing Paul's lack of credentials, Paul didn't have the credentials uh, the apostles set forth in the first verse of Acts, but he was called directly by Christ, and that calling was affirmed by the apostles themselves. All right? That's not to say that his, apostle, uh, his authority was derived from the apostles. Rather, Christ gave him the authority, and Paul reminds us, that, uh, reminds us of that often throughout his other letters. His authority was granted to him by Christ, and that authority was confirmed by the other apostles. No other prophet, and I use that in quotes, no other prophet of any other religion or cult can claim that sort of confirmation. No one. No one. That's something I sure couldn't do. I, I couldn't come in here claiming that Christ called me. You know, I, I, could, I could come in here claiming that, right? But I certainly couldn't claim that that confirmation from the apostles who walked with Christ and were a witness to his resurrection gave that to me or confirmed it. I couldn't, I, there's no way I could claim that, right? This is something that... Uh, Charles Russell, Joseph Smith, or, or Muhammad, or any other prophet, anyone who calls himself a prophet, or any other cult leader, or whatever, they cannot claim that. They can't claim that. That's what sets Paul apart. Does that, does that make sense? Does that make sense? Any questions or thoughts or comments about that before we continue? Make sure we don't have any here on line two. Anyone? Does that, does that make sense? Again, it's not, it's not that uh, Paul, it's important to understand, it's not that Paul was given authority by the apostles, the apostles recognize his authority, okay? They recognize his authority. Now, there remains one more question, one more question that we might ask uh, of Paul and the Bible and, and Jesus for that matter. There's one more thing that might bother you about the apostle Paul, all right? Let, let's just say we're satisfied with the explanation. 
let's just say we're satisfied. Okay, Paul was confirmed by the apostles, but I'd like to ask one more question. Why did Jesus feel the need to use Paul? Right? Why, why, couldn't he get, why couldn't he just keep things nice, neat, and tidy? And why couldn't he just have called one of the original apostles, like, you know, Peter, James, or John? It seems like that would have been so much more, more tidy and, rather than calling this, this outsider. Why, why, didn't he, why didn't he do that? Because, again, doesn't that throw a little bit of doubt on here? Of all the people he could have called, of all the people, he, he could have called any one of his original 11, right? But instead, he calls this outsider. Why? Why did he do that? Paul served a special role, okay? Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles. Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles. Okay, great. But again, why couldn't Peter, James, or John be the apostle to the Gentiles? I mean, after all, Paul himself, was he a Jew or a Gentile? He was a Jew. He was a Jew. So why is he, why is he the apostle to the Gentiles? Okay, yeah, do you know? He was a Roman citizen. He was a Roman citizen. He was a Jew, but he was also a Roman citizen. Okay? Now listen to this. I, I want to, you know, the answer, it was Paul a Jew? Listen to this. Listen to this. There should be no doubt here whether or not Paul was a Jew. Because again, he told us this over and over and over again uh, throughout his, uh, his uh, other epistles. Uh, Circumcised on the eighth day, he says, of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisees, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Okay? And then also in 2 Corinthians eleven twenty two and following, he says this of himself. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they offsprings of Abraham? So am I. Okay? So if there was ever a Jew, if there was ever a devout Jew, right, it would be Saul. You couldn't find a more Jewish Jew than Saul, which what makes his calling as an, as an apostle of the Gentile all the more curious, but you're right. There's something special. There's something unique about him. Okay, if we back up to the start of, uh, uh, you know, nearly the beginning of, of two millennia ago, right? It would have been about the year 5 AD or so when Paul was born. What's going on at this time? All right, this would have been right around uh, near the start of the Roman Empire, and, and, and the Romans were taking over the world. So, so Saul was Jewish, this meant his parents were Jewish. And during this Roman rule, it would have been common for uprisings to occur. And, and to squash those uprisings, right, that would have meant that many people were de deported and scattered to other parts of the Roman Empire. This is how they did it. This is how they sort of diffused these uprisings. Scatter them out. Scatter them out. Now, we're not exactly sure how Paul's parents ended up in Tarsus, right? But they did. They ended up in Tarsus. It was common that the Jews were spread out to different parts of the empire. So, yes, that was common. What was uncommon what was very uncommon for the most part, most Jews were not Roman citizens. Most Jews were not Roman citizens. Citizenship outside of Italy was an honor reserved for only a select few. So presumably, Paul's parents must have been some people of influence of some kind, right? Maybe even wealthy. Paul was the son of a Pharisee. So at least this tells us that perhaps he was wealthy and, and wealth probably afforded him some sort of privilege. But whatever the case may be, it was an oddity, not a rule. It was an oddity, not a rule that, that Saul, a Jew, was also a Roman citizen, okay? So do you know how we say that, that uh, Jesus was, was fully God and fully man? We can almost say the same thing about, about Saul. He was fully Jewish and fully Roman, right? And, and, this, it, and it was unusual. It was an unusual background that made Paul uniquely qualified to serve as the apostle to the Gentiles. Why? Because again, as a Jew... As a Jew, as a really smart Jewish man trained by Gamaliel, arguably the time's most well-known experts of the law. So again, Saul understood the law. He knew the law. He was an expert too, but he was also a Roman. A highly educated man, a man of the world who spoke multiple language. Paul, Paul could have blended into any part of the Roman Empire, which at the time was the whole world. It was considered the whole world. He could have gone anywhere in the Roman Empire and blended in just fine, right? Do you see why God in all his wisdom, chose someone like Saul to be an apostle to the Gentiles? Because there are a few people, there are few people who understood the Old Testament like Paul did. Very few people who understood everything that, the, that was required of the law and, and spelled out in the law. And those that did understand that much of the law, there were precious few beyond that 
who could make their way around the Roman Empire the way that Paul did, right? And that's what made him the perfect person. That's what made him the perfect person because of his comprehension of the Old Testament and his comprehension and understanding of the Roman world, which was basically, again, the whole world at the time of his conversion. So if you're going to pick someone to spread the gospel to the world, who better than Paul? Who better, right? And when you see, again, when you see little details like this come together, it goes back to what we were saying last week and the week before. This can't be made up. This can't be made up. Who could have put something like this together? It has to, it has to be of divine origin. Am I right? This is crazy. This is crazy. Let me finish uh, with this quote. We'll, we'll wrap up and open up for questions. Let's finish this with this quote from uh, C.S. Lewis. It says it perfectly. Reality, in fact, is usually something you could not have guessed. That is one of the reasons I believe Christianity. It is a religion you could not have guessed. It offers us just the kind of universe, if it, if it had offered us just the kind of universe we'd always expected, I should feel we were making it up. But in fact, it is not the sort of thing anyone would have made up. It has just that queer twist about it that real things have. That's a great summary of our Bible, right? It, 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 it's just too bizarre. It's too crazy to be made up like that, that a man like Saul would have been born somewhere else, a Jew of Jew, but still born somewhere else. And, and, and who could have planned that? Who could have planned that, that that would be the man that would then take the gospel to the rest of the world? And someone like Saul. That's why, we, that's why we believe Saul. That's why we believe the words that he says, and that's why his credibility. Anyone have any thoughts, comments, or questions beyond that? Anything at all? Don't be bashful. Anyone online too, please send me a, a, a chat if you wish. Everyone understand it? Everyone, does it, do you feel better about uh, uh, explaining why Paul has credibility? How about this? Here's, a, here's one final question for you. True or false? At, on the road to Damascus, the Lord changed Saul's name to Paul. True or false? Say it again. False. False. Did, so the Lord didn't change his name from Saul to Paul? Who did that? He did it himself. You know why? Saul is his Jewish name. Paul is his Jewish name translated into the Roman world, Greek. And again, it's like I said, he's fully Jewish, fully Roman. And again, it's, it's, it's like Saul and Paul are, are one and the same. And again, what better person than that to go about in the Roman world to the rest of the world and give us the gospel? I love it. I love it. Anyone else? Final thoughts or questions? Yeah. About the timing. Obviously, God knows the beginning and the end. So, what was unique about that timing? There are a lot of Christians that did the dust of the fall. Yeah. Yeah, so what was unique about the timing of when, instead of, uh, for instance, why uh, after there had been... Yeah, save a lot of Christians. You know, yeah, I know. That's a good point. It could, why, why didn't uh, we convert, why didn't he convert uh, Paul, you know, right immediately after the ascension or right immediately after uh, the resurrection, right? There's, there's a, I, th I think, in a sense, it somewhat gives... Uh, Again, this is, these are God's reasons, I don't know, but if I had to guess, it, it gives Paul a little bit of credibility. Because again, just like C.S. Lewis was saying, this is, you, you, you can't make this stuff up. When someone like, imagine, just in, in common terms right now, imagine if tomorrow you heard that uh, Nancy Pelosi became a, a Republican. <laughs> You'd think, what on earth? <laughs> What happened? You know, we could say the same thing about, uh, you know, anyone else on the, you know, Mitch McConnell becoming a Democrat, right? You think, what, what is happening? What just happened? And I think there's credibility in that, that someone, the most egregious opponent of the Christian faith, suddenly is now preaching the Christian faith with enthusiasm, with conviction, and is, is now writing to the churches. That gets my attention. That gets my attention. And again, I feel awful for the Christians that lost their lives, for, who are martyred. But again, God and his wisdom. And one day, you know, when you think about that, he will undo, undo those, those, those people's death that, that died, the, the martyr's death, and he will, and he, those people will be glorified in heaven, you know? So I do shed a tear for him, but I also think great is their reward too. 
Uh, one day they're going to be, they are right now beholding the presence of Christ. So that's, that's how I'd answer that. It's a guess. It's a guess on my part. I think a pretty good guess though. <laughs> Someone else? No one on that? That's right. On the road to the map? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Ruth was commenting on the fact for you, those of you online that uh, she didn't realize that that was the timing of, uh, of Paul's name change and thought it was perhaps because of uh, he had a bad reputation to Saul. But if you're reading through the book of Acts, just read through the book of Acts and notice that about right halfway through, almost without, without uh, um, announcement or anything like that, it goes from Saul to Paul. What was the timing? What was going on right around that time? That's when Paul was about to set out on his missionary journeys and head outside of the Jewish world. Suddenly, that's when he starts being referring to himself as Paul. And you can imagine his scribe, Luke, doing do that very intentionally. You know, like, okay, now, game on. Game on. It's Paul, you know, his name in, in the Roman world. So, yeah. Anyone else? All right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so it certainly was. It certainly was. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it was. Uh, we're being. Uh, there's a comment here that's saying that uh, it was not uh, popular for for Paul to. It might have been very difficult for him in a course, and he was. He was imprisoned for it. But here's the here's the neat thing about that. Again, you read this in the book of Acts is that uh, you know, he, he was preaching the gospel, and so then he was imprisoned by the Romans, and then what happened? He says, I'm a Roman citizen. You can't imprison me. You can't imprison me. And people are like, Yo, you're a Roman citizen? And suddenly, you know, suddenly it's a different ballgame. If it had been a Jew, if it had been any of the other guys, any of the apostles just about, right, he would have stayed in prison forever, but instead he was able to invoke the authority of, of Rome. And that's ultimately what put Paul in front of, uh, of, of Caesar, because of his, his, his claim as a Roman citizen, what other disciple could have done that? None of them. None of them. And again, that's why I just marvel. I'm like, this is, it's so amazing. And I can't believe God did this. I shouldn't be surprised. But again, how it works out, you can't make this stuff up, folks. You can't do it. You can't do it. Anyone else? All right. Well, hey, thank you for joining me. And I appreciate you, you taking the time to be out here. Uh, I kind of like this space. Well, we can play it by ear. And if you'd rather be in here than outside as the weather gets colder, um, for, as long as they warm it up in here a little bit, right? Yeah. And as always, we'll continue to Zoom with the folks at home. So thank you for joining us at home. And uh, hey, we'll talk to you next time. We'll see you.